And if you could please confirm that you can view the opening slide for us. Yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I want to thank Neri for hosting this important educational we webinar, my colleagues for their time and effort in contributing to the webinar, our sponsors at the National Science Foundation and GEAR, as well as the audience for taking the time out today to listen in and contribute. We have organized this web webinar as follows. Um, I'll begin with some introductory remarks. My colleague, Dominiki Asimaki, will discuss seismology, mechanics of this event, ground motions associated with the event. And then Professor Kevin Franke will speak about the work of the advanced team, the advanced survey team in this, this event. I will continue with discussion of the main team efforts and findings. Uh, Professor Mayoral Villa will talk about a key geotechnical issue from the event that is side effects and response observations, and finally offer some conclusions and open the discussion to the audience. And we note that the discussion can be tracked by using the chat box in the Zoom features. The speakers today uh, include uh, Professor Juan Mayoral Villa of UNAM, Dominique Astimaki of Caltech, Kevin Franke of BYU, and myself, Tara Hutchinson, offering you some introductory remarks. I'm from UC San Diego. So let's uh, just begin. Um, certainly the societal impacts and importance of this particular earthquake cannot be understated. Uh, there's a appreciable historical context for the country of Mexico and not to be withstanding the anniversary of the devastating 1985 event. Indeed, 28 million people were within the zone of exposure from this event, nearly 9 million dwellings, 54,000 schools, and by some estimates, upwards of 57,000 hospitals affected, almost 370 confirmed deaths, more than 6,000 injured. Just in the region of Ciudad de Mexico, more than 40 buildings collapsed. Notwithstanding widespread wide span impact to the states of Morales and Puebla, and losses upwards by some estimates of 2 billion US dollars. Mercalli intensity of this event was upwards of seven. So GEAR, along with international colleagues, developed, developed an advance and main team to visit the affected areas. And we'll share with you the work of the advance team, which spanned across five days, the main team, which logically followed, and the leadership and support of UNAM colleagues led by uh, Juan and his students and colleagues. Um, uh, Kevin Frankie led the advance team, myself, I led the main team, and of course we had the on-ground continual support of the GEAR steering committee and leadership. We want to thank them for their efforts. The, both the, ma the main and the advance team um, carried with them various remote sensing tools, um, most notably uh, a number of unmanned aerial vehicles, um, as well as a LIDAR um, a laser scanning device. We visited almost uh, upwards of 30 sites with this equipment, collected more than 300 gigabytes of data, more than 10,000 images. And we, we want to give offer a plug here that you know, much of this data is being collected and formulated into poetry and 3D rendered models and videos. And we're attempting to make this available through the de design safe repository. Uh, indeed, we were fortunate to have colleagues with expertise in seismic testing. Uh, they performed more than 40 tests in, CDM, in the Ciudad de Mexico, Puebla, and states of Morales. 
including surface wave and uh, HRV measurements. The outcome of this, this effort, and if you're looking for additional information, um, of course the GEAR Association repository is a wonderful resource, notwithstanding we uh, offer to the community an immediate, an immediate uh, version one report published uh, published with uh, a, a wide set of appendices with additional sites of interest to the community and a more detailed comprehensive second version of the report published earlier this year with an expansion of these sites and case histories and additional processed seismic and UAV and other data. So with that, I'll uh, introduce my colleague, Dominiki, who will speak about the seismological characteristics and ground motions from this event. Thank you, Tara. Uh, Zoom says, there we go, now. Can you confirm that you can see the slide? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, so I will give you an overview of the seismodectonics of the region, the mechanics of the event, and some information. Dominique, about we, we yes. can see that we can see the. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. We can see the speaker's view, however. Mm -hmm. Ah, interesting. Oh, okay. That that is interesting. If you have two screens, you may have to select the other screen. Mm. Much better. Much better. Yep, great. So, this is the tone of the area and uh, some information about the uh, strong ground motion, spatial variability, as well as uh, regional information about the site effects that uh, will then be a lot more, uh, you will see in a lot more detail uh, further down the webinar. So the, uh, the, the Mexico City is, uh, the Mexico is located on the uh, on west work of the, Middle America Trench. I am, I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm having a hard time. There we go. Okay. It's located westward of the north of the Middle America Trench. Uh, Middle America Trench is the location where the Cocos Plate is subducting below the North American Plate. The Mexico City is located approximately in the area where the two plates are uh, approaching at 76 millimeters uh, per year. And uh, the, beside, in addition to the to subduction zone earthquakes, uh, of which uh, probably the most uh, familiar that we all are is the magnitude 8 uh, 1985 earthquake. There are also uh, there's a, the, the approaching of the two plates uh, creates crumbling of the overriding plate and therefore creates a high mountainous region. And the subducting plate melts underneath the mantle and then uh, uh, finds its way through the surface to the lighter continental crust that overrides the subducting zone, and that creates a very actively volcanic uh, active volcanic. Uh, uh, high volcanic activity in the area. So, the Puebla Mexico City, which is the event that uh, we are talking about, uh, was a magnitude 7.1. It occurred uh, at depth of 50 kilometers, at about 116 kilometers from Mexico City. The um, event, the depth of the event, as well as the um, the uh, moment tensors, the solution of the rupture, indicate that it was an intraplate motion that occurred in the in the in the Cocos plate that is uh, subducting below the North American plate, and it was actually a normal fault that had an extensional uh, characteristic, and I will show you what I mean by this. So it happened close to the Middle America trench, but not on the the, 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 the trench, so not on the same sub. Uh, area as the 1985 
So if we look at the, um, at the cross-section of the complex uh, shape of the, um, of, the, uh, of the subducting slab geometry on the right-hand side, can you see my mouse? Yes, maybe. So on the right-hand side, you see that the subducting plate um, dips below Acapulco in a, with a relatively low deep angle, and then below all the way to Mexico City is relatively horizontal, and then it dives right below Mexico City at a much steeper angle. This uh, the thick uh, purple line right here is the subducting slab. The event that we're talking about happened right at the location of the maximum curvature. So it was like a snap of a, of a, um, a, of a chalk, uh, uh, um, um, an extension event. And this mechanism is different from the mechanism of the 1985 earthquake that happened. As you can see here, the little red slide on the in the subduction zone along the trench. So this this difference of this uh, difference of uh, of mechanism between the eighty five earthquake and the twenty seventeen uh, event caused uh, both uh, differences in the magnitude in the in the in the amplitude of the ground motions, the duration. In addition to that, it was much closer to Mexico City, and as a consequence, it uh, also carried a lot more of those high frequencies that didn't have enough uh, distance to attenuate as it happened in nineteen eighty five. The event, the, the crustal event, uh, the 2017 event was definitely not the only one. Although we are more, uh, you, we are more familiar with the, or the bigger, the mega thrust earthquakes are probably the ones that we are more familiar with. There have been several uh, historic earthquakes in the same region. The color code in this slide. Is, uh, represents the mismatch or misalignment between the subducting slab, so let's say at the, at the location of the trench, and then the dipping part uh, of, uh, of the slab where it takes a turn towards the mantle. So if those two sides of the slab are, are uh, well aligned, it means that the, 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 the area that is available for the, for the Subducting zone to sleep is really large, and therefore we expect uh, large earthquakes. And then the 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 the, the highest the misalignment, then the highest that curvature is, and therefore we expect the uh, crustal events. So the 2017 happened right here at the transition zone, and the red and the yellow areas are where we expect the higher events. The the lines with the numbers 20, 40, 60, these are ISO depths that basically show the depth of the subducting slab below the surface. And a different view of the same, uh, of the same uh, historical uh, information, these are the subduction zone events. This is the 1985 event that we're familiar with, the 2017 magnitude 7.1. I should point out that uh, 11 days before, uh, I think on September 8th, uh, there was the there was oh, there was an event, uh, a magnitude 8.1 event that preceded the Puebla, Mexico City. There was initially some discussion about one affecting the other. Uh, if we look at the Coulomb transfer uh, stresses between the two events, there's no interaction, so they were they were basically uncoupled, and the mechani the mechanics of the 8.1 uh, event were also uh, normal faulting. So they were also most likely that lab. Uh, it was an inter lab earthquake that had an extension on which. Okay, so focusing now on the 2017 uh, characteristics of ground motion in Mexico City, uh, I will try first to give you a brief comparison with the 1985 earthquake. Because the two events, as we said, one was a subduction zone, so the sleep is long, and therefore we expect that it generates relatively long period waves. The 2017 event was a crustal event that is a snap and therefore has a very short rise time and carries a lot of high frequencies. The 2017 event happens a lot closer to Mexico City, so it doesn't have to, the, the ground motion has enough high frequency arriving in the city. And the differences that we expected to see was one had a lot of high frequency content, the 2017 event, and the 1985 event had much higher long period waves, that both because of the type of the event as well as the distance of the epicenter from the, from the um, 
from the Mexico City basin. So this is all, this is shown here. We compare uh, two sites, one in the outskirts of the basin. This, according to the um, to the Mexico City to the to the Mexican uh, design code provisions, is characterized as the hill zone. Uh, the Me Mexico City basin is. Uh, covered by a maximum 10, uh, uh, maximum 100 meters of uh, high water content clays, clays, the location where the clays are deep, uh, higher than 20, 30 meters is, uh, is uh, characterized as the lake zone from now on, and you will see a lot more <laughs> about that by my colleague uh, Juan Mayorandia. And uh, the, the, the outskirts, where the, where the sediments are, uh, when the sediments end, are called the hill zone, and the in between section is called the transition zone. So, the uh, a grand motion, two, two stations that recorded both events, the 2017 and the 1985, we can clearly see the 2017 event has much higher. This is horizontal period, these are 5% uh, response spectra, uh, response uh, spectra of the two grand motions, much higher low period high frequencies than the 1985. 1985 had uh, quite a bit of energy around two seconds that got significantly amplified in the deeper parts of the lake zone, as opposed to the to the um, 2017 event that basically did, that didn't have a lot of energy in that in that uh, if, uh, period range, and whatever energy it had was uh, indeed amplified by the by the sediments in the lake zone. Uh, one way to compare the two events would be to just plot a, a spatial distribution of spectral acceleration at different periods. And this would tell us uh, where, at what parts of the basin, uh, what parts of the basin amplified what parts of the spectrum of each event. So on the left hand side, you see clearly a low period, 0.3 seconds. This is two, three story building uh, would be affected by this kind of motion. These were amplified throughout the basin. It was, as we said, it was the uh, incident ground motion was rich in those frequencies, in those periods. On the right hand side, magnitude 8. Uh, was was amplified. The amplification happened only in the areas where the sediments had the same period in uh, had the same period, and therefore were able to cause amplification of the instant the, the instant motion didn't contain as much energy. Those frequencies and whatever frequencies, whatever amplification you see here, it was caused by the sediments. It was not uh, because it, the, the incident motion carried a lot of energy. Same thing with the medium period of around one second, eight to 12 story buildings. You can see on the left hand side, it was uh, uh, widely amplified across the, around the basin, except of course the deeper parts of the, of the sediments where the resonant periods were higher, uh, were, were longer than, the, than, one, than one second. On the right hand side, again, what what caused the amplification was the sediments that picked the little energy that the incident motion had of the 1985 event and amplified it as much as they could based on the resonant characteristics of the signature of those sites. And uh, going to longer periods, uh, magnitude 7.1, there was almost no energy, so there was little amplification in the outskirts of the lake zone. On the, on the other hand, uh, the longer periods were the ones that arrived and were therefore significantly amplified by the 1985. A different way to see the same problem is to take the seismograms at different locations and filter them through specific band passes in, in specific bands and then observe the waves as they pass from different sediments. So here, the, the first the band passes between 0.5 and 1 second. This is 1 to 2 hertz, relatively high frequency ground motion. You see the hill zone. You can see here the insert where I'm showing the example of the filtered uh, time series. This area was severely damaged, as you will see later on. So it was of interest to the team to study the ground motion spatial variability. High frequencies arrive at the hill zone. They are uh, significantly amplified in the transition zone. And then they are uh, basically uh, the, 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 the deeper part of the sediments here in, in uh, SCT2. 
didn't have uh, uh, enough uh, site amplification signature to 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 resonate with with this frequency band. So this we expect to see much higher amplification at longer period waves. But you can see two things. First of all, it's uh, we can clearly see that the the, the, the shallow sediments amplify that frequency range, so it is consistent with our one D such response understanding. The other thing we can see is that there is a relatively high spatial variability, both in amplitude and in duration. Notice those two sites, for example, CIO5 and CO5. 56, the distance is less than one kilometer and there's a, a substantial uh, difference in amplitude and in uh, duration. On the contrary, CO56 and BA49 that happen to be on different zones according to the building code uh, have very similar patterns and you will see that uh, again when we look at site, uh, site, regional site response. Same thing for longer periods, one to two seconds, a lower content in this case, because uh, as we said, it was richer in the high frequency, but th there's still enough energy in that frequency range. Significantly amplified now in the outskirts of the lake zone, in the outer parts of the lake zone. The transition zone is, has two shallow sediments to ring with this frequency range. And of course, SC2, as you can see here, duration and, and, and amplitude much higher. BA49, and the, the deeper parts of the basin, this is probably too deep to ring with this frequency range. However, CO56, we expect it to have also high amplification uh, similar to the other stations of that zone, and it, uh, it's not as high as we expected. So there is, a, it's either the, 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 the zonation has evolved over time because of the effect that we will discuss later, or uh, uh, there is a very strong spatial variability in this area here that uh, is not uh, is not uh, well understood by means of our one-dimensional site response uh, principles. And the longer period waves, the larger than two seconds, these were the ones that were severely amplified during the 1995 uh, the 1985 earthquake. You can see here the the incident motion carries almost no energy in those very little ringing, but then the the sediments have so much the signature of the sediments is so predominant in this in this uh, pre uh, period range that the uh, amplification is uh, um, quite spectacular actually. Uh, and you can see that the transition zone almost doesn't respond. It's too, too high frequency to see the long period shaking. But then as we move to deeper and deeper sediments, you can see more and more clearly the effect of the resonance of the sediments with the, under, with the incident ground motion. Uh, the similar concept we can, uh, we can see if we plot the 5% uh, damped response spectra. Uh, now I'm showing a, a sort of a more uh, zoom out view of the basin. Um, uh, you can see here the response spectrum at ES57, which is the transition zone, 0.3 G maximum spectral acceleration at one second. Uh, remember that uh, spatial variability, the, sp the, the plots of the spatially varying uh, spectral acceleration that we saw earlier. The UC44 is the, the outer lake zone, again, high amplitude this location. And CO57 is in the transition zone, but has a peak at a much low, at a lower half, as 0.5 seconds, as opposed to one second here. So the, 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 the depth of the sediments within each zone varies enough that uh, it is not exactly, it's not, it's not clear the, 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 the distinctions from one zone to the other are not uh, uh, reflecting the the variability within each zone of the depth of the of the sediments. And you can see here the the, the, the middle, the deeper sediments, AU11 peak at uh, 1.5 seconds. This would be comparable to the uh, to the period where we saw amplification during the 1985 earthquake, and that's similar to the peak that we see at SCT2 where the peak spectral acceleration at 1.7 seconds is approximately 0.62. The one, one more, the last, oh, uh, the last thing that we did was to compute the spatial variability of the so-called empirical site response. The empirical site response is the, is the, we, we estimated two different measures. The first one was the surface to rock outcrop spectral ratio. 
which is the more traditional site response instrument. We use the station TACY as a reference station in the hill zone, although a lot of other stations in the hill zone have their very similar frequency characteristics. The ratio of the two uh, is the dark black line. And at the same time, we used the horizontal to vertical spectral ratio, uh, which is a more uh, approach that's more widely used in uh, seismology. The reason for that is because it is a measure of site response that can relatively well predict the frequency. There is no frequency at the site, not the peak, not the amplitude of amplification. Uh, and at the same time, it does not require a reference site, which eliminates a lot of the issues when we have a single station estimate of the site response. The, the, the interesting news were, like, were, were that uh, for the most part, the peaks, the, the frequencies of the peaks of the two measures coincided. Uh, if not exactly, they were uh, fairly close to each other. Uh, and that was good news because in this, in this way, we can uh, estimate uh, at least the resonant frequency of the site response uh, in absence of a uh, well characterized uh, reference station. What was, in, what was also interesting was to see the, the, the strong spatial variability of the resonant frequencies. Uh, in this area of two by three kilometers uh, that I'm showing you here, this area here, the, we had site, site periods, excuse me, site frequency that ranged between 0.47 and 0.74 hertz. So it was very large variability between those two stations where you remember there was strong variability in the response too. And the amplification varied from 7 to 56 peak amplification. So uh, this again suggests that some of those of this uh, of this variability can uh, you will see later on that can well be explained by means of uh, one this site response uh, of a very strongly varying depth interface depth between the shallow clays and the deeper sediments, but on the same time. Uh, distances uh, smaller than one kilometer that show so high uh, change, so large change in the uh, resonant frequency also beg the question of whether or not uh, we should we should consider two-dimensional and three-dimensional side effects in the prediction of uh, this trend. And the last thing we did was to look at other crustal events. So we did, we repeated the same exercise. We computed site amplification factors. But for uh, three more crustal events, similar magnitude, order of magnitude, similar distance from Mexico City as the 2017 event. And interestingly enough, some stations showed the, the properties, the site response properties invariant with time, at least in terms of the resonant frequency. And other stations, for example, uh, AL01, and other stations had uh, significant vari variation. TL55, uh, VM29, LD17, you can see them here. I superimposed this plot with the subsidence observed by the European Space Agency uh, of Mexico City. As you well know, there is a very intense pumping of the Mexico City aquifer. Uh, this is the subsidence between uh, October and December, two months, 2014, and the variation is uh, centimeters per month. Varies between 2.5, minus 2.5 and 2.5. So there is a, a there is a, a little heat, but for the most part there is a, a subsidence. And the question becomes uh, how strongly those uh, properties vary as a function of time because of the because of the, the rapid consolidation accelerated also by the uh, pumping of water, and on, and also how three-dimensional is the variation of those properties? How can we extrapolate the, uh, in time? There's some, there's some studies that have been done, but uh, it remains to, for us to compare our empirical findings with uh, the prediction of those studies while extrapolating the properties uh, for uh, a continuum pumping down uh, in the following, in the, in the future and uh, trying to refine those predictions so that we can make a, a, a accurate assessments of site response in Mexico City, accounting for the three-dimensional site effects, for the geometry, the stratigraphy of the basement and of the interface between the clay and the 
deeper sediments, and also their evolution with time, the interaction between drug water pumping and subsidence and ultimately updating the seismization. Thank you for your patience. And with that, I will pass the screen to my colleague, Kevin Franke, who will talk about the advanced team efforts and findings. Great, thank you, Dominiki. So uh, are you all seeing my screen now? Yes, we are. Great, thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure, everybody, and I appreciate the invitation to summarize the uh, efforts from the GEAR Advance team. We were uh, on the ground about five days after the initial event, and uh, it was really a, an amazing experience to not only meet uh, several wonderful individuals, but to learn a lot uh, about this event, and particularly uh, as, as Dom talked about, and, and also Juan will talk about later, uh, the important observations related to site response. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to summarize the activities and the findings from the advanced team. Uh, the advanced team was comprised of several individuals uh, that uh, actually had originally, most of them volunteered to be part of a gear reconnaissance mission for the magnitude 8.1 earthquake that occurred near Oaxaca on September 8th. As we were making preparations to uh, depart for that event, the uh, magnitude 7.1 event occurred near Puebla. And the gear steering committee made the recommendation, uh, which we followed, that uh, we should change our efforts to investigating Mexico City and, and the surrounding region. And so we quickly changed our plans and uh, instead converged on Mexico City and, and met up with Juan and, and many of his students. And uh, we were able to achieve the objectives that were set out for us. And these objectives, uh, I'll define here, our, our first objective was uh, to really perform a rapid visual inspection of the region. We, we did not want to get in and do very detailed investigations or observations. We wanted to go in and just almost surficially document the damage that had occurred, uh, make note of it, uh, identify places that uh, we felt were of particular interest and were worthy of additional investigation. And then we wanted to move on from those sites and go and, and and find more sites. The purpose being that we wanted to lay the groundwork and, and establish the, the necessary network to allow the main team to be successful in their mission and, and to thrive. And, and we hope that we're able to accomplish that. So uh, in the few days that we were there uh, in the region, we traveled a lot of distance. And, and this is a plot that shows the tracks from the different vehicles uh, as you can see, the, the majority of our efforts were involved in the Mexico City uh, vicinity, particularly in the heavily damaged areas near Condesa, uh, La Roma, and uh, in, in that vicinity. But we had teams go out and investigate other parts of the city and then move outside of the city into the areas of, uh, that were impacted uh, closer to the epicenter like uh, Morelos. Uh, also Puebla, uh, but again, these individuals that went down there were just documenting and making notes of potential sites of interest that, this, that possibly merited additional investigation. Now, uh, to, to help establish why the things happened the way they did in this event and also in the 1985 event, I think it's important that a little bit of background information is provided relating to the, the geotechnical conditions in Mexico City. And, and Dominique uh, referred to a, a few of these things, but, but I wanna backtrack a little bit there and make sure that, that everybody's on board. Uh, following the 1985 event uh, and, and the severe uh, site response observations that were uh, made there, uh, researchers went ahead and performed site period measurements across the, the Mexico City Basin. And based on those site period measurements, they 
delineated the basin into a series of zones, and, and these zones are are delineated based on the the uh, thickness of the lake bed sediments and and the measured uh, periods of the sites across the basin. So whenever you saw the the colored images from Dominiki, that's uh, what that that coloration was referring to. Now uh, in this event here, the 2017 event, the the main zones of interest were Zone 2, Zone 3A, and Zone 3B. Zone 2 is what is commonly referred to as the transition zone. Uh, zone 1 is, is commonly referred to as the hill zone. And Zone 3 is the lake zone. So Zone 2 is that, that transition between the hills and the lakes. Uh, thanks to uh, Juan, uh, he provided some of these uh, figures that give us an idea of what the soil profiles are like at these different zones in the city. So on the left is a typical zone three soil profile and you can see that uh, the lake bed deposits, these uh, Texcoco clay deposits, go down to depths anywhere between 30 to 40 meters and then you get into some pretty stiff material below that, some uh, dense sands. Uh, but in the zone two material, it, it's much more variable. You can see that there's a mixture of the lake bed uh, sediments, but there's also more sand, and it tends to be more interbedded and layered, and the material overall tends to be a lot more stiff, thus uh, explaining why the zone two soils tend to uh, amplify the lower period or higher frequency ground motions more uh, readily. So uh, immediately, and, and it didn't take very long for our advanced team to identify these trends, but as we started uh, using some of the great uh, community tools that were made available uh, in during this event, like from Google, uh, we were plotting essentially the damaged and collapsed buildings uh, from the 1985 and the 2017 earthquake events. The, the 85 event is shown in purple, the 2017 events are shown in blue. And when we overlay these events with the different soil zones, there began to be a very strong pattern that uh, appeared. We started to see that most of the 2017 damage was isolated to uh, just uh, portions of zone two, zone 3A and zone 3B. And later when more statistics became available to the advanced team, we, we started to compile the actual number of buildings that were in these areas and, and you can see from this table down here that the vast majority of structures that were damaged during the 2017 event were in these uh, three map soil zones. N now, as we also started to uh, converse with our structural engineering colleagues and those that were out mapping, uh, it also became clear to us and, and those, those professionals communicated to us that in, in almost nearly every case they, they observed, that all the buildings that were damaged were either uh, pre-1985 construction, meaning that they had been impacted and potentially damaged in the 1985 event, and or they were located in zones 2 or 3A or 3B. And so uh, we feel like this, just having this view of the structural damage really helps us to wrap our arms around what happened in this 2017 event. As far as uh, individual types of damage that we observed, uh, we were particularly interested in, in observing how foundations performed. Now, in Mexico City, there were, there were essentially three main types of foundations that we observed. There were end-bearing piles that were driven down to uh, dense soil layers, and the structures were completely supported on these end-bearing piles. Uh, now, over time, the end-bearing piles, uh, of course, don't settle with the surrounding soil of, of Mexico City. Uh, here on the figure on the left, you see uh, a building that is supported on end-bearing piles. The, the threshold of the door where my arrow is located uh, used to be level with the ground. This structure was built in 1966, and, and since 1966, you can see that the surrounding ground has settled uh, over a meter. Uh, 
but the, what we observed was that this earthquake caused uh, additional accelerated settlements in these clayey lake bed soils uh, surrounding these end bearing pile structures. And so uh, it was not uncommon to see these types of structures where we observed between one to 15 centimeters of differential settlement uh, between the, the surrounding ground and the structure itself. Uh, you can see that in both the structure on the left and the structure on the right in, in this slide. Uh, one of the uh, topics of interest that's unique to Mexico City is the use of um, control pile foundations. So these are, these are foundations, pile foundations, where uh, essentially on top of the piles you have a series of screws where uh, technicians can incrementally lower, or if they wanted to, raise the building. And so they're constantly re-leveling the building and lowering the building incrementally with time in an attempt to keep the building level with the settling ground around it. Uh, in 1985, these types of foundations supposedly got a really bad reputation because a lot of the buildings that experienced problems and collapsed were, were built on these types of uh, foundations. We found one building where the uh, owner was was more than happy to let us go down there, and it was uh, down beneath the building to inspect the foundations. And uh, the building uh, appeared fine. It was the La Plaza Condesa, which is a, a, a culturally significant uh, structure in the Condesa neighborhood. The the building was functional. It was operational. Uh, the the employees were in and out of the building. Uh, we were able to go down and, and, and see, and, and of course you can, looking at this picture for instance, you can see that uh, some engineers might be nervous how a building like this would perform in an earthquake, but, but the building seemed to perform fine. Uh, when we looked at the building, it's a very large building, th there appeared to be a one degree tilt to the north, and when we actually measured it with some of our tools, we confirmed that. But it's unclear to us what the tilting was caused by. Was it the earthquake that caused it, or was it simply due to uneven leveling over time? Uh, and was that tilting present before the earthquake? Uh, nobody really could answer that for us, but um, it, it's a question that still remains. The third type of foundation uh, that was commonly seen was, a, 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 well, I should say the second and the third types of foundations were either raft foundations or a combination raft with floating piles. And uh, what was interesting to us was uh, the fact that these foundations didn't perform as, as well as we might expect. Uh, one of the interesting mechanisms that seemed to occur as, as these buildings were rocking and, and you have these friction piles that are moving with the surrounding soil, uh, it appears that the friction piles may have lost some of their uh, strength or the frictional resistance from the surrounding soil, which resulted in some permanent tilting of some of these buildings because of the earthquake. Now, as, as I mentioned before, many buildings in Mexico City are tilting, and they've been tilting for a long time. And, and so the only way for us to characterize which buildings were tilting before or because of the earthquake was to speak with the owners or the occupants that actually lived there. And so in, in, in cases where we're able to do that, uh, for instance, in the picture that's shown here, the owner of the building said uh, that prior to the earthquake, both of these buildings were, were vertical, but after the earthquake, uh, the building on the left had a two degree tilt to it, and it was supported on these uh, floating pile raft combined foundations. The interesting thing about many of these structures is that we, we really didn't identify any other significant structural damage. Uh, there wasn't a lot of evidence of cracking or differential uh, uh, settlements, or there wasn't a lot of evidence of um, jamming doors or windows. The buildings just simply tilted altogether. Uh, and so this was, this was an interesting finding, and it, it also suggests that uh, maybe we need to look closer at the cyclic softening and deafening, or, or uh, cyclic softening of clay soils when we use these types of uh, foundations. Now, um, there's a question that's coming up, and I'm going to go ahead and address it right now. Uh, what is the water table depth in the damaged area? Um, may, 
Juan, maybe you can hop on and, and give us an idea of that. What, what's the water table depth we're dealing with in, in say, Condesa? It should be around uh, two meters depth or something like that. Something between two and two and a half meters. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> let's see. Let's go back to the presentation. So uh, another thing that was uh, a few of our advanced team members saw that uh, when they initially observed them, they were very, very interested in uh, were these, these long, uh, apparently random, kind of scary looking uh, cracks and subsidences throughout several streets in the vicinity of Colonia del Mar and, and other neighborhoods on the southern part of Mexico City. And uh, the more they investigated these and they put a drone up in the air, you can see in the figure on the bottom left that a lot of these, uh, these cracks and depressions, they, they went beneath uh, multiple buildings, they extended across multiple uh, city blocks, <clears throat> and they really uh, caused us to scratch our heads as we tried to identify what it could be. Was it a liquefaction feature? Was it... Uh, a slope deformation feature somehow, uh, but then continued uh, investigation into that question by members of the uh, the team, particularly those from uh, UNAM, were able to, to identify some previous written reports that uh, indicated that there had been some uh, subsidence cracks that have developed in these parts of the of the city due to uh, groundwater removal. And so as, as Mexico City is slowly starting to settle, uh, there's going to be this transition from the hill zone to the lake zone. And you can expect that a lot of these tension cracks are going to start opening up in that transition area. And so as we started to compare some of these previously mapped subsidence cracks with what we observed following the earthquake, there was a pretty good agreement. And so it suggested to us that the earthquake likely aggravated several of these existing cracks uh, and, and may have also uh, initiated some new ones. Uh, we were asked to investigate quickly uh, the performance of bridges. And so we had a couple of bridge experts on our team and we were able to go and, and investigate uh, multiple sites around Mexico City and outside of Mexico City I can say that overall bridge performance seemed to be pretty good. There were just a handful of examples that we observed where bridge performance was poor. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm showing here pictures of a pedestrian bridge that collapsed during the event. So the picture on the left is, is showing the collapsed pedestrian bridge. The figure on the right is the pre-earthquake bridge taken from a, a Google Street View image. Uh, members of our team also observed uh, another highway bridge south of Mexico City that uh, had supposedly completely collapsed, but they were not given access to go look at that bridge. Uh, fortunately, members of the main team were able to get over there and, and see that. Some of our uh, friends that were in the area at the time were also sending us information related to bridges. So these images came to us from Professor Eduardo Miranda at uh, Stanford University. And uh, he was sending the, uh, some of these images of a, of a bridge abutment on uh, a different part of Mexico City. You can see the, uh, the coordinates and the avenida are, are given here with the picture. But uh, there's a lot of evidence of spalling, maybe some pounding that was occurring. And so, you know, this type of damage is pretty superficial, but uh, so nothing too serious that, that seems to have occurred. We were also asked to investigate the performance of social and, or, or buildings of social and cultural interest. And so uh, all during our investigation, our team members paid special attention to these, these unique and, and very important structures. So. Uh, one of the things they observed, for instance, was that many, many of the churches throughout the region were impacted by this earthquake. There was lots of damage with collapsed uh, bell towers, for instance, or, or tilted or damaged bell towers in almost every single village and uh, city that they were uh, visiting. 
we went and assessed the uh, historic district of Mexico City. Uh, and when I first saw it, I got uh, really agitated saying, oh, wow, look at all the tilt of structures. This is, this is incredible. We need to document this. And then all of uh, my uh, friends that were with me uh, informed me that, no, the, those buildings have been tilting for a long time. And so uh, apparently there was not any new damage to this historic district. And, and most of these very old and important buildings weren't really affected by this earthquake. Again, these buildings are constructed on, on the uh, lake zone deposits, so very, very soft soil sediments. They seem to perform uh, just fine. We were also asked by the GEAR Steering Committee to see if we could go and investigate the new international airport that's uh, being constructed in the northeastern part of Mexico City. It's called the NAICM uh, project. And uh, fortunately, we were able to uh, work with the, the fine individuals at Parsons and ARUP to uh, arrange a visit. And we were able to fly a UAV over the construction site and uh, image and, and create three-dimensional models of the uh, construction of, of that terminal. And uh, it's absolutely huge. This is just a screenshot of the 3D model that uh, I just pasted here onto the slide. In fact, um, the 3D models are, are publicly available. And, and as Tara mentioned earlier, we're working to uh, get these available to the public through the uh, NERI Design Safe. So this is a 3D model developed from UAM, or UAV imagery of the construction site of the terminal. And then we were allowed to fly also the construction site of the new uh, control tower, which you can see lots of driven piles and it's a parabolic uh, foundation uh, as well there. So uh, very interesting things that uh, we're eager to share with the public. Overall, the performance of that facility was just fine. Uh, there was some evidence of uh, a little bit of movement uh, in the excavation zone, for instance. This figure on the left is a, uh, a screenshot from the UAV 3D model. And you can see some cracking around the perimeter of the excavation. And, and this type of deformation was pretty common following the earthquake, but it's nothing serious. Uh, some tilted piles, as shown in the figure on the right, were also apparent, but uh, the foreman at the construction site uh, informed us that uh, these piles, uh, for the most part, had been installed uh, at an angle, and so they were uh, like that before the earthquake, and they were going to need to be repaired. Now, there's a, another question that's coming in. Uh, could you ask, also talk about the damaged building pattern, total class, partial cracked, and any tilted or building without much damage? Uh, we'll talk about that um, I think in, in a, a later uh, presentation, I'm not going to address those specific questions in, in, in this presentation. So uh, a few additional observations and conclusions. Uh, we did see some landslides and rock falls, uh, mostly outside of uh, Mexico City, and those were documented in our reports. So nothing terribly serious. But uh, those, those, what we did see uh, was documented. In total, the advanced team uh, identified 18 sites of potential interest that were recommended for further study to the main team. And those sites were summarized in the appendix of the uh, version one report uh, from GEAR. Uh, as, as Tara mentioned, we were able to make use of uh, UAVs not as much as, as maybe we would have liked uh, due to the uh, speedy nature of our mission, but uh, we, we were able to collect some very interesting imagery that uh, resulted in some great 3D models of some of these sites. Some of our team members were also able to perform some horizontal vertical spectral ratio measurements uh, to confirm uh, previously mapped site periods across uh, the damaged regions, and, and what we observed was that these, these measured site periods corresponded pretty well with the previously published site periods. 
Uh, overall, we were pretty pleased with the uh, results of the advanced team and this, this model of sending an advanced team prior to a main team. I think uh, and I hope that it, it made the efforts for the main team a little bit easier and allowed them to zero in quicker on the sites of, of potential interest. So uh, that concludes at least my portion of the presentation. And, and now uh, I'd like to turn the time over to uh, my colleague Tara Hutchinson to summarize the activities of the main team, which arrived the week following the advanced team. Thank you so much, Kevin. If you could confirm that you can see the presentation view of the screen, that would be helpful. Uh, not the presentation mode, no. Yeah, I see the presenter mode. The presenter mode. Okay, how about that? Yep, that's yeah. it. Okay, thank you so much. Looks great. Thank you, Kevin, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and with that, we, uh, we continue chronologically, yes, uh, with the efforts of the main team. Uh, I want to certainly acknowledge the talented group of individuals I, I had the pleasure to work with, both U.S. and international uh, colleagues and researchers, as well as the uh, arsenal of, uh, of uh, uh, physical tools we had at our, at our vein uh, in, in the field. So the main, the UNAM GEAR main team objectives um, were to review the key sites identified by the GEAR advance team in greater detail and as warranted expand those the knowledge you know the information regarding the characteristics of those sites both through walking surveys um, in, in hopes of developing damage maps and understanding mechanisms and extents of damage in particular areas offer an expansion to uh, the information regarding um, the site the periods at particular sites using seismic tests, uh, expand uh, the aerial survey information in particular to, to generate ortho-rectified post-event maps, and I'll sh share with you some of those which we were able to process. And where warranted, we had brought with us a LIDAR scanning tool, as I mentioned, and at particular sites we, we, we identified uh, where we may the scanning of that site may be useful for future study. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the GEAR Advance team did a phenomenal job identifying sites rapidly after the event. However, of course, you know, new knowledge is coming in and we, we kept our ears and our eyes open in the effect that there may be other heavily impacted regions, both in the main city and, and the surrounding states of, in particular, Puebla and Morales. Through this effort, we remained in constant communication with the advanced team members who had returned from the field. So that was certainly a wonderful experience. In addition to complementing those sites and data collected by the advanced team, the tracks here of the main team are overlaid, at least in the near vicinity of the city of Ciudad de Mexico. Um, in addition, the advanced team spent quite a bit of time trekking southbound both to the west and the east of the epicenter. And a key aspect of GEAR's ongoing efforts has been to understand the link between ground failure and structural damage. So as such, we, need, we require some type of indicator of performance for each of these. For this reconnaissance, we draw on the work of Bray and Stewart, who advanced the concept of ground failure and structural damage indices and utilize it to characterize damage patterns emerging from the Adapazari event in 1999. Local damage or local ground damage severity in this case is assigned a minor to major gradation with qualitative interpretation associated with the severity of, in this case, settlement and tilt. This is one particular strategy one may adopt. And you'll see in the damage, damage maps in a moment that we elected to identify buildings with their border color and associate 
that border color with a cool color uh, where no or li little to no damage was observed, let's say a GF grading of zero to a red color where severe uh, ground failure was observed. Uh, the most severe ground failure associated with more than 25 centimeters of settlement would be associated with, let's say, greater than 25 centimeters of settlement to more than three degrees of tilt. Structural dam damage features can similarly be as assigned to damage severity. And in the earlier work of Bray and Stewart, they elected for a five gradation system. And you can see the qualitative interpretation here, finally uh, extending to the most severe categories of D4 and D5, where a portion of a building in plan view or potentially the entire building collapsed and, and or a loss of a floor was impended. Um, important for developing such maps is the availability of high-quality orthorectified um, georeferenced images of a damaged re region. And I think we're, we're all quite happy that we had at our utility um, the avail availability of UAVs to offer and support the development of damaged maps throughout the region we, in we inspected. So an area which Kevin talked about, and I uh, thought it's maybe a, a nice link between the Vance and the main teams, particularly due to its high importance in the region, uh, was the La Condesa area. Uh, Kevin's team surveyed both via aerial surveys and walking surveys. This region identified it, placed it in high priority for the main team. So we, en we enriched this we enriched this uh, uh, survey in the field. Um, and you can see here a zoom in of the La Condesa region, the white box is showing walking survey areas, the blue box is showing you where um, UAV aerial surveys were performed. Um, importantly, um, there are, uh, while there are no measurements directly within this zone three lake bed deposit, directly adjacent or just north to this region, there is a measurement available uh, uh, and was at, which was active during uh, the event. Um, that nearby sensor demonstrates the long period superficial spectral content of between 1.6 and, and 2 seconds. So clearly, um, taller structures will be vulnerable, uh, vulnerable to strong shaking. So pairing all of this information together leads us to, uh, to damage maps. These particular pairs of maps of those two walking survey areas show approximately 100 buildings that were surveyed in the La Condesa region where severely damaged and or collapsed buildings were observed. Other important information could be co-located with these, these uh, maps, such as building height. You can see the numbers delineated within each of these building profiles. One can immediately observe that, uh, that more than 80% of these buildings have heights on the order of less than three, three stories, and that these shorter buildings were graded mostly with no structural damage. Those of heights between six to 10 stories, at least in this, severe, this region, of this region, suffered most, the most significant damage. And most in the moderate to severe structural damage categories, of course, um, uh, uh, offer us a hint at their categorization as well by classifying them through their, through their height. The damage maps then allow us to immediately identify contract, contrasting response and mechanisms dictating such response. So for example, here are two mid-rise buildings from that damage map in the La Condesa region. The upper one dominated by structural damage with no evidence of foundation movement, uh, whereby an intermediate story collapse is immediately visible. One might grade this as a G0 D5. In contrast, the lower building, a 14 story uh, structure uh, with evidence of foundation moving, movement and potential rocking of the base of the foundation while it suffered structural damage was a, a nominally, nominally less, uh, less in structural damage uh, localized at the wall piers. We call it the maximum horizontal acceleration, not directly, directly within the zone of this building, but nonetheless nearby was on the order of uh, uh, from sensor C105 occurred at about 1.6 seconds. So that would lead us to, lead us to um, support the fact that this 14 story, much taller building um, uh, was subjected to increased um, amplifications of its input, its input accelerations. Enriching the data set further of the advanced team allows us to reflect on regions in the city which crossed various geozones. And I believe Juan will talk about this and the importance of side effects across these geozones in a moment. One such comparison is shown here. 
um, where you can see the zone 3A adjacent to the zone 2 transitionary soils in the red and the orange respectively. Two survey regions, the Robsema La Morena and the Escocia uh, survey region were, um, were de visited, in de visited in detail by both the the advance and the main team. The Rapsema La Morena region in, uh, included a mix of two to eight story buildings and three cases of uh, greater than G1 um, ground failure. Um, whereas the La Escocia uh, region inc included three to nine story buildings and no cases of ground failure. Um, so clearly side effects played a significant role in this area, notwithstanding the likelihood of of many of these structures being vulnerable to their, their age and their potentially weakened characteristics such as soft story. Um, we can nonetheless though um, understand, understand from some of these case studies the clear relationship between the depth of the lake bed deposits and the performance of some of these structures. Uh, other issues that were shared, um, touched upon by Kevin and expanded upon by um, by the recommendation of the advanced team was a detailed survey of uh, the ground subsidence issues in the southern region of Mexico City. Specifically, it's Tapalapa, where ground subsidence of up to 40 centimeters per year has been observed due to the pump, primarily due to the water pumping from deep aquifers. Kevin shared this map earlier up in the upper left, but uh, what you might also notice are these black dots. Our team went out and identified more than a dozen additional and specific case study sites um, upon which um, detailed surveys of, uh, of, of crack patterns, uh, both length and amplitude of settlement and correlation between ground damage and building damage would be important to map for the community in this region. Um, and so this data is in our report. This is just one such table summarizing some of this, some of this damage. Importantly, um, due, to the, the, due to the services that might, of course, must, must support uh, the community here, this ground subsidence, which was now on the order of a meter, um, resulted in a series, of, uh, a series of extensive damage to sewage, both sewage and freshwater pipelines. Um, the GEAR team mapped more than a dozen of these such ground features, as I mentioned, trucking through, through various neighborhoods and small business districts. Universally, it's really no, it's, uh, easy to note that these cracks had a significant effect on, uh, on dwellings, as shown here, uh, businesses, as shown in the lower right, and utilities, as we saw in this image, the previous images and this upper image in the right. Um, this uh, large regional ground depressions being adjacent to to such various types of infrastructure manifest a significant structural damage features above ground. Uh, I showed that earlier uh, map of this region. Um, in addition to um, our work on the ground, we performed, uh, of course, a series of UAV flyovers. That does allow you even, in fact, as you're going back to your office, to take a look again at regions you might have missed Here's one on our screen now. I hope the video is caught up. Um, you can see a ground depression going through a dwelling. So further uh, mapping of regions that you were not even able to uh, survey while in the field uh, by foot can then be continually con considered and assessed um, uh, with the use of low altitude aerial imagery. And so I think this is going to be a, a, useful, a useful feature for useful feature and data set for the community uh, in, the, in, in the near future as it assesses, it is, as it assesses um, uh, the situation in this region. Uh, ortho and oblique views of, a LIDAR of various LIDAR models are also helpful in this context. We collected a number of them in this particular region. Um, the pair of uh, snapshots on the left are from such LIDAR scans. You can see, of course, if you set, if one sets a LIDAR up correctly from an orthogonal angle, you can clearly see the depression of the pavement. Um, multiple LIDAR views allow you to generate plan views as shown in the lower left. And those plan views can give you detailed measurements um, of the field, in this case, uh, field and surficial uh, ground uh, depressions and patterns which in this case manifest in significant uh, damage to the 
uh, to a series of, of uh, multi-story buildings on the right. You can see up to 75 centimeters, uh, including um, some down drag of an, addition, of an adjacent six-story structure. Uh, with this issue well known to the community, the team was pleased actually to also observe that select cases, select cases where modern design had considered the potential for ground subsidence. One notable design for success, I would say, uh, was the case of a multi-building complex uh, it, within the general hospital, Tao Huac. Uh, it's, this is a modern hospital constructed about five to seven years ago prior to the 2017 event. It's really the largest hospital in the region and services the entire uh, Colonial Del Mar region uh, and surrounding community. It too rests on, uh, on lake bed soils characterized as, uh, as zone three soils. You can see it's just at the outskirts of one of our survey areas. Uh, two notable large surface cracks were observed at the backside of this hospital. You can see them in the imagery here in the lower, uh, lower portion of this figure. Um, those surface cracks uh, clearly transect through the building complex. We could see that evidence through gates and various features that the cracks crossed. But, but fortunately, the hospital was designed to accommodate this ground differential, differential movie. You can see in the elevation imagery here, the relative displacement of one building to, to, to the other. In addition, we understand that services to each building incorporated flexible piping systems to minora, minimize the disruption to the hospital operations. So simply all that was needed, needed if you look at the aerial views here, was some, uh, some tarps, uh, some tarps placed over for water and environmental protection immediately following the event. Locals noted that the hospital was closed for only two days following the event and no patients were evacuated. Uh, as, as we discussed, um, we certainly wanted to enrich the, uh, the spatial uh, extent of our reconnaissance efforts and the advanced team had taken a very brief trek uh, uh, south south of the city of Mexico uh, and approached and approached the epicenter. Um, they suggested this in a much more detailed survey to the to the main team. Uh, so 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 I've got a handful of slides here discussing uh, some observations we made in the state of Morales. Morales is located in south central Mexico and bordered by the state of Mexico to the northeast and northwest and Puebla, the state of Puebla to the east. Uh, so, so in essence, Mexico City is situated north of Morales. The state is the second smallest in the nation uh, and its capital is, is Cuernavaca to the north. Um, it's, it's very much um, an agricultural community. Uh, the state itself, its uh, topography is very diverse with more than 50% of it being mountainous, or hilly and the remainder on flat terrain. Um, uh, seismic maps uh, provided to us indicate that, that the state is largely in an intermediate seismic zone where earthquakes are not as frequent. However, certainly the general, um, generally competent material in many cities uh, and proximity to the epicenter gives rise to the potential for a strong ground shaking in the region. Here is the epicenter just south of this Google Earth snapshot on the left. Um, and our treks here in blue uh, span from north to south, largely through the entire state. Um, it is noted that um, as, as one treks from north to south towards the epicenter, increased damage is observed. You could partially blame this on local soil conditions. For example, in the northern city of Emilio Zapata, um, the city's largely resting on rock from the previous um, geologic maps we just looked at. So in fact, fairly minor damage is observed in the city of Emilio Zapata. One could imagine that the amplification is low, although no sensors are available in the state of Morales. Um, as you nonetheless, as one treks south southern towards the epicenter, you begin to see, in fact, moderate damage in the city of Santa Rosa, Trenta. Um, the first instance of a, a collapsed adobe building is observed. And finally, um, the southernmost city, uh, qu quite devastated city of Yehudla, uh, uh, resting on largely allu alluvial soils, we measured a site period of just under 0.3 seconds, suffered quite severe 
collapse, um, an immediate preview of damage maps uh, the team generated following their observations in the city, um, you know, and as well as uh, low alt altitude satellite imagery um, indicate that more than 80% of the commercial district and 50% of the dwellings within the city uh, suffered complete collapse. Most of these, of course, were adobe, masonry, infill dwellings. However, the commercial district is noted to be of relatively modern commercial con uh, uh, construction. N quite notably, no evidence of ground or foundation failure were observed in the city of Yehudla by the GEAR team. Uh, the state of Puebla, on the other hand, is in the highlands of south central Mexico. We spent quite a few days uh, traveling through the state of Puebla due to its proximity to the fault and importance to the region. Uh, the Gear Main team spent probably three, three days there. Um, it's approximately 80 to 90 kilometers northeast. The central part of Pueblo is from the epicenter. Media reports noted significant impact um, to the communities within the state of Puebla, though it had not been receiving significant um, attention, let's say, of course, due to the preeminent issues in the city of Mexico. Uh, nonetheless, the Secretary of State noted that 120 in the state, or about uh, just over the majority of the state, were in a, a state of extraordinary emergency. The governor declared that uh, nearly 2,000 homes or dwellings um, were completely destroyed. Uh, the more majority of these were in uh, Adlixco, Itzucar de Matamoras, and Mixteca. But nonetheless, the, uh, the GEAR team began with the more modern cities and then transcended um, um, wet south westbound towards these more damaged cities. It's also important to note that two accelerometers recorded this event, stations X SXPU and PHPU, um, approximately 1.8 and 3 kilometers um, to the west and to the east of central downtown plaza, of the central downtown plaza. The characteristics of these, of the measurements from these events are quite different. You can see the uh, spectral accelerations, velocities, displacements in the upper right plot here of PHPU, um, which is closer to the hilly region, most notably uh, very little long period content in contrast, um, uh, approximately three kilometers west um, of the central plaza in downtown, the, sens the sensor PHPU in the lower central portion of this plot demonstrates um, notable long period content uh, outward of two seconds. And in fact, although it had, did not receive much attention, uh, one very interesting area surveyed by the GEAR main team is outward of Santa Fe, where clusters of low, medium, and high-rise buildings were adjacent to each other. You can see a number of three-story buildings in the uh, foregr foreground, a tw tw cluster of 12-story buildings in the immediate background of this lower left image, and then 20-plus story buildings, uh, high-rise buildings. In fact, the most severely damaged buildings were uh, the 20 plus story buildings, uh, which were being unfortunately uh, uh, covered up. The damage to them was being covered up during the, during the visit by the GEAR main team. So a few concluding remarks. Um, I think we, we've reached uh, an important, uh, an important uh, let's say unanimous uh, point here uh, by both the advance and the main teams that, that site response was, was immediately observed and has been, a, you know, has been a recurring and key issue. And so, uh, Juan will speak in great detail about this uh, in his in his presentation next. Uh, foundation performance plays a role in that. Whether or not uh, foundations uh, offer a nominal amount of rocking, and thus shed some of the potential demands to structures, whether or not controlled piles are available, or and or if regional subsidence. Is, presence, is potentially present um, in the phenomena controlling response. Um, these regional and site effects and impacts and distribution of damage, I would say, uh, you know, one could, one could offer some consistent logic across not only the Ciudad de Mexico, but also the states of Morales and Puebla. Uh, just important to note, I think, uh, 
Unlike other events, there are some geotechnical features that were not present in this event. For example, uh, liquefaction was not observed and surface rupture was not observed. So with that, I'll uh, turn the baton to Juan. We'll talk about uh, one of the, really the key issues in this event. Thank you, Tara. Can you see the presentation, guys? Yes. Yes, we can. Well, thank you. Well, thanks, uh, guys. Uh, I, I don't know if I have anything left to say after you have uh, presented all this uh, uh, exhaustive review of, the, of, our, of this effort. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just add some observations uh, that I, I'd like to share with you regarding uh, site response and observed damage. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by revising some conditions prevailing in Mexico City. Mexico City was uh, built on top of uh, two former la two lakes, the former Texcoco Lake and the Xochimilco Chalco Lake. Um, eventually, the city spread to the skirts of the basin and to the hills. Um, and uh, we have then three main geotechnical zones that are going to control the seismic uh, risk within the city. Uh, when we move from the from the basin uh, edge towards the uh, center of the lake, we're gonna have uh, a varying uh, thickness of clay uh, as long as we're going uh, deeper into the center of the lake, we're gonna have a larger uh, period, a larger fundamental period. So that uh, is well captured in the 19, in, in the 2004 Mexico City Building Code, uh, that effect uh, in which uh, the lake area is divided into four main zones, just as uh, Kevin just mentioned, uh, where the periods are going from, from uh, one second all the way up to four seconds in the central area of the lake. And uh, in the skirts zone, the transition zone, we have periods, periods around one. And in the hill zones, we, we, we may have lower values for these fundamental elastic periods. Uh, the, clay, the clay that is found in these former lakes uh, are unique. They are very compressible. They are a low, uh, low uh, shear strength clays. And, uh, the typical shear wave velocities that we we can have are uh, it can be all the way from 35 meters per second uh, up to 70 or 80 meters per second. So we have uh, very low uh, and very soft clays. And uh, other problem with these clays is that they have they exhibit a very high plasticity index. So the uh, linearity they, they exhibit a very uh, they, they do not exhibit uh, too much degradation um, or increasing damping, even for shear strains on the order of 3%. So what that means is that uh, the, the clays have a lot of potential for amplifying seismic waves. So we have these very compressible, compressible clays, these high plasticity clays, uh, and on top of that, we have uh, uh, ground subsidence in the city. Um, due to water extraction for um, water supply purposes, the whole city is sinking, and the the, the rate, the average rate can, uh, of uh, this uh, gram of siren is about 15 centimeters per year, but it can go in some areas all the way up to 40 centimeters, and uh, of course this is going to affect the performance of the ground uh, and the performance of the city. Uh, especially in the in the areas near the basin, near the borders, we're going to have ground cracking, we're going to have differential settlements, and uh, we're going to have also uh, some uh, uh, reduction in the in the period of, of this clay, in the fundamental period of the clay, uh, due to uh, ground subsidence. Essentially, the thickness of the clay is getting smaller, and the clay is getting stiffer. 
So in areas, for instance, where uh, we used to have in 2004 periods of uh, uh, four seconds, now we have periods, uh, lower periods, periods of three seconds. Uh, when the 2017 earthquake struck the city, there were two uh, main uh, groups of uh, seismological stations working, the Ceres station and the UNAM station. They recorded the ground motion in the, in the three zones that we just mentioned. Uh, if we do the exercise of uh, plotting the, the response spectra of the recorded ground motion, we will notice that in the, in the hill soil, uh, most of the energy is concentrated between, uh, the, between 0.5 to, to, sorry, that uh, the, in, the, in the hill zone, most of the energy will be concentrated uh, between, the, uh, between 0.15 to one seconds. And uh, so this was already pointed out by, by Dominic. Uh, the, we have uh, um, the energy is concentrated in the low period range. If we go to the transition zone, we're going to see that uh, there, there is going to be a larger amplification in the, in the period close to one seconds. And if we go further within the, within the lake in zone 3.8, we're going to see how this period is getting larger and larger, going all the way from 1.2 seconds to 3 seconds. So essentially what we have is that the, the, the records were able to, to, um, were able to show that uh, there, is going to be, there is a response associated to the fundamental elastic period of the ground that somehow has been mapped and uh, included in the, in the former version of the building code. So how those things relate to the, to the damage, to the absurd damage? Well, here again, I'm showing a, a figure that has been uh, already presented by my coworkers, uh, where uh, the, by my colleagues, where essentially the, uh, most of the damage and the uh, severe most of the severe damaged buildings and the collapsed buildings are located uh, within the transition and the zone 3A. And we can relate, we can relate the, the damage with the, with the period that occurs in this area, as we're going to show uh, in, the, in the next slides. Uh, if we look into the damage that was also observed during the 1985 uh, earthquake, we will notice again a relationship between the predominant, uh, between the fundamental elastic period that here is about two seconds and the damage and the type of structures that were damaged. Here, what I, what I want to, to do is to make a, a correlation between the uh, predominant period, uh, the fundamental period of the soil, the predominant period of the excitation and the uh, structure period. And the, to do that, we can plot we can plot the damage distribution uh, uh, on top of the um, uh, on top of the map that is showing the the periods that were uh, measured recently and that, that was were confirmed by the by, by the gear team. Uh, essentially, here where, where La Condesa is located, we we can see that periods were close to one. Uh, uh, they, they were around one and they went all the way to 1.2 seconds, like here in Roma Sur. And uh, here where we have the, the downtown area, uh, where we observe most of the damage in the 1985 earthquake, the period was about two seconds. And here in these other areas, we also have uh, periods close to 1.5, two seconds, and uh, some of the questions that uh, we will try to answer is why we don't, uh, why we didn't see any damage uh, in this part of the city. Well, we will look into that in a few slides. So somehow we can um, explain the the damage in terms of uh, of um, a typical side effect and structure structure in, in solid structure interaction problem, uh, just as it was done for the for the 1985 earthquake, 
Here, uh, the uh, energy of the earthquake was concentrated between 0 0.15, 0 0.15 to one second in the, in the hill uh, soil, in the firm soil, and uh, most of the damage uh, occurred where the soil deposits uh, had um, a fundamental period of, about, of 0.8 to 1.5 seconds, and it affected uh, uh, buildings with uh, 5 to 80 story. And uh, the, the structural period of these uh, buildings is, is about 0.8 to 1.6 seconds. Something similar to what happened in 1985, where we have a, a double resonant effect in the late zone. We have an excitation with the energy con mostly concentrated around two seconds that is affecting a soil deposit in the downtown area right here that has a, a two seconds period. And of course, it's going to affect the structures with that, uh, with that type of uh, structural period. So uh, most of the damage was, was observed uh, in buildings uh, uh, which, uh, which exhibit five to 20 stories. So we can, we can uh, somehow relate the damage uh, to the uh, structure type uh, by looking at this uh, um, uh, figure that is trying to summarize the findings that were, that, that were reached uh, in Mexico City. Uh, there was a lot of damage uh, in La Condesa and uh, the, the type of buildings wa wa was uh, associated to a period that, uh, resonant, uh, that uh, was in resonance with the, with the soil. And uh, the same thing happened in La Colonia del Valle. Similar things happened in Miramontes. But what happened, uh, and also we have some damage related to seismic induced cracks in Xochimilco and in Colonia del Mar. But what happened in these areas where we, where we don't have any damage? Well, uh, we look into, into those areas and we found that here in particular, uh, the, well, in, in, in all this area, as can be seen in the picture, we don't have anything built yet. There is gonna be a, a new airport here and there is gonna be, a, there is right now, there's a lot of urban development here, but there is nothing there, that's the reason why nothing happened there. And then here we have uh, houses which are, which are uh, uh, two to, uh, to three story houses mostly. And the tall buildings are designed uh, based on um, more modern uh, design criteria than the ones that were uh, built here in La Condesa, where, where uh, built, uh, which uh, the construction time was about uh, 60 years to 70 years ago. And, and here in this other area, we have the same kind of situation. Essentially, uh, these are uh, two to three story houses, uh, some warehouses that uh, they perform fairly well during the earthquake, uh, which uh, uh, fundamental, which uh, structural period was larger than the one uh, that affected the buildings in the, in, in the Condesa area. Now, very close to La Condesa, we have tall buildings, like uh, in Paseo La Reforma that were not affected uh, because you know the predominant the structural period was was larger that, than the one uh, of the structures that were uh, damaged. So final remarks: most of the damage was observed in five to eight story buildings. Um, structures uh, essentially the, the period of the structures ranging from 0.8 to 1.6 seconds. And these were located in a ring associated with uh, uh, elastic fundamental periods going from 0.8 to 1.5 seconds. Most of the building collapse was due to side effects, but poorly repaired structures from the 1985 earthquake and those with lack of maintenance exhibit low performance. And uh, finally, the energy of the excitation was concentrated between 0.15 to 1 seconds and close to the fundamental elastic periods of the so-called Sun tree and transition leading to important ground amplification. With that, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, the GIR Association and all the sources of funding that uh, uh, allow us to complete this, this work. And uh, I would like to, to turn the microphone to, to Natalie to see if we open the, the floor for questions. Um, okay. We actually asked people to put questions in the chat, but if you'd like to go ahead and unmute and ask a question, we can try that too. Natalie, 
there was yeah. there was one question that was asked during the seismology section that yeah. I would like to address since that was the first one that yes, I didn't have do. time. Uh, so the question was: Is is this based on recording motions or numerical simulations? I presume this referred to the. Uh, results of uh, site amplification that I was using. Everything that was shown in the first part of the presentation was based on on, on records. There was no simulated ground motions. So the the attempt was for us to see what the what the ground motion tell us about the site response. And contrary, I mean, I guess uh, complementary to to what my my colleagues were saying, the the, the ground motion spectral ratios. Uh, sample a large part of the of the of the shallow layers of the crust as opposed to a uh, site characterization that we do through non-destructive testing so surface waves and as a consequence when we mapped those periods or frequencies that were revealed by the ground motion empirical amplification factors on top of the periods that were revealed by the site characterization that was done after the 1995 earthquake there was a mismatch in in some areas uh, and the question is is this just the difference in the parts of the crust that are sampled or is it the evolution with time between previous measurements and 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 current site response changing by because of consolidation or because of subsidence uh, and these are questions that uh, we are we are looking into but we don't have answers yet Uh, Natalie, I think that um, Kevin answered a few questions during his talk, which was great. I'm just right. going through the the chat. Um, I'm not sure I see any new. Um, I don't see any new ones either. Um, folks on the line, if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them now in the chat so they can address them. I think um, any of the, the presenters, of course, would obviously be, uh, oh, here's a question. Shall I just read these, Natalie, I suppose? We didn't, uh, yes, please go ahead. Um, uh, there's a question, is there any evidence to address the effects of the Mexico City Basin? I think, uh, Dominique, that sounds like a question for you. <laughs> Yeah, when when I when I don't unmute my microphone, I yeah. uh, <laughs> there's some a problem with Zoom. Uh, yeah. Is there any is there any evidence to address the effects of the Mexico City Basin? Yes. Uh, so so I mean, if, field obviously is meaning field evidence at this point. Uh, what, what is the can can you be a little more specific with regards to what it, yeah, addressing the effect means? Uh, yeah, maybe the, uh, the person that asked the question could expand uh, in the chat line. Because there are observations of effects right. of basin effects, which is non-one-dimensional site response effects, but there, we don't have simulation-based evidence mm -hmm. yet. We just see adjacent uh, strong motion stations that we assume must be on relatively, I mean, they, they belong to the same zone. Mm -hmm. They are so close that we, we, we assume that one decided response is, is similar. And, and despite that, the frequency content of the ground motion recorded was different. The site, the empirical site response was different. The duration was different. And the question is, is it a three-dimensional effect because of the wedge of the transition zone and how the waves are trapped in that location? Is it because the 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 the, the, the um, interface between the shallow and the deeper sediments the, the changes rapidly as a function of of distance? That is just two different one D site responses right next to each other. And, the, 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 the geometry that changes rapidly, or is it interaction between the deeper sedimentary, the regional basin, which is approximately another 400 meters of, of uh, 
Miocene volcanics below the clay. Uh, so is it the interaction between those deeper sediments that apparently have a resonant period similar to the site response of the clay? Uh, of the shallow of the of the lake of the middle of the lake zone so we we don't know yet we are trying to put together an international group of people to develop a three-dimensional uh, uh, velocity model of mexico city and being able to couple that with regional ground motion simulations uh, try to understand mm -hmm. a little better the distribution of ground motion expected but uh, as of now, the evidence is just uh, observational and it's as dense as the recordings were. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, mm -hmm. I wanted to add something. Uh, and there is, there is um, I mean, there are areas uh, within Mexico City, especially in the Xochimilco Chalco Lake, the, uh, in, where the, the transition between lake and, and hill is very abrupt. So that's. Uh -huh. There you will have to take into account three-dimensional effects. Yep, you yep, yep. To predict the um, the ground motions, and it's going to be a couple problem between the response of the sediments, the deep sediments, and the effect and of the of the hills uh, right. movement acting on top of the um, uh, acting generating surface waves. So yes, right. I think if you are very close to the to the basin, you will need to take that into account, especially in the Xochimilco Chalco Lake. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Juan. Okay, I guess there's a there's another question here. Um, according to recorded motions from this event, vertical acceleration appear to be higher than the previous major events. Um, have you seen any studies looking into this? Um, seems to be also a, a question possibly for you, Dominiki. Um, so I'll start and then Juan can chime in or yeah. you guys can chime in if you... Yeah. Yeah. I, I think... Compared to the subduction zone events, if that's the major previous events we're talking about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so relatively horizontal to vertical, the vertical is closer to the horizontal in terms of amplitude, of mm -hmm. peak amplitude, but, but that's just because the long period waves uh, of the, the, it was yeah. mostly the surface waves that survived by the time they got there, plus the mechanics of the subduction zone slip was gave rise to much longer period waves. The 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 7.1 event just happened to be a sort of like a, a, cra a plate crack, right? The, 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 mm -hmm. the, the plate bent and then where the extension is higher than the strength of the material, there is a, there is a, a normal folding crack. And so that, that gives rise to to P as well as S waves, and they traveled not too far, about 100 kilometers until they got trapped in the Mexico City Basin. So within the sediments, vertical accelerations don't amplify that much. Hence the H over V, and that could be H over V ratios that were close to the empirical side amplification is actually a proof that this assumption is not far from reality. But so I don't think there there are necess I don't think, but I probably I'm, it could be wrong. I don't think the vertical were higher. I think the vertical to horizontal was higher than the subduction zone type events, and that's just purely because of mostly because of source. I, yeah. Is the yeah, go ahead, Juan. Yeah. I agree with that, but uh, it, it, it depends. Essentially, if you are if you are in, in Puebla, uh, you are gonna you definitely are going to have a larger vertical vertical component than the horizontal. If you compare the subduction to the to this normal event, uh, definitely you're gonna have uh, in Mexico City a, a larger a larger vertical component than of the was observed in, yeah. in the, uh, during the subduction 1985 earthquake. Yep. Yeah. But but in Puebla and in, in Morelos is is an issue that should be studied and it right now is being addressed. The, I, the I, thing is that I don't know. Do we have recordings next to the the from the other crustal events, for example, the ones that I showed earlier, uh, the 2000 or 1999 or 1980s, the ones that happened in the same region. The vertical acceleration was similar in in my in my view. Because the distance was similar, the magnitude of the events was similar, and therefore this kind mm -hmm. of earthquake at this distance gave similar vertical 
in Ramos Mexico City, and, yes, but in yes, Puebla yes. Uh, you could observe that much. Yeah, each, each one, each one gave yes. relatively high vertical right. acceleration near the epicenter, its That's corresponding right. epicenter, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. And then you will see the effect in the structures that are low period, low period structures such as bridges or or dams, right. and like that. Not in building. Right. Flexible. Right. 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 Well, you could see that in that single measurement in Puebla, just you know, less than five kilometers from 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 the easternmost uh, sensor sensor of, from the from the plaza in central yeah. Puebla. That 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 sensor actually captured a little peak in the vertical component, consistent with its with its horizontal components, whereas whereas the easternmost sensor did not, and so that would give rise to to any vulnerability of taller rocking induced type of type of motions. Um, as you as yep. you approach the epicenter, yeah. there's a there's another question here um, for Professor Mayoral. In the event of 1985, there was evidence of soil liquefaction? Question mark. If the answer is yes, what could be the geotechnical difference for this event? Not in Mexico City. We have mostly clays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we didn't have soil liquefaction right. in, in right. the. 1985 earthquake. There was nothing in the outskirts, correct? There, there was yeah. nothing in the outskirts. The, the thing is that the clay that we have in the outskirts right. is is, um, is, is uh, the water table is very low, right? And right. Very cemented, so we don't have loose sand uh, to have this liquefaction problem. Right, right. I, I don't. Uh, okay, not sure if there was something more specific that the the folks asking the question were looking for, but I agree with that. Uh, so, let's see. I'm not, I don't see, unless anyone sees any new questions on the docket there. Maybe we'll give it another minute if anyone wants to ask any last questions. Or if any of my colleagues have any additional comments uh, based on the, the question and answer uh, portion. Oh, well, um, hearing none, um, I suppose I would propose we conclude the webinar, Natalie. Um, yeah. And I want to thank the audience and, and my colleagues, and, and of course, we've thanked our sponsors for the, for the work here. Uh, okay, here's another last minute question, <laughs> just catching us. Uh, is this a one-time event? Will there be more? Now, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll let Juan answer that question. <laughs> All the work you put into uh, such a fantastic. Maybe, uh, we, maybe we can gather in San Diego and 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 then have some some, some more uh, uh, things like this going on. Don't you think, Tara? I, I think that would be great. I think that would be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. We can gather in a month from now in San Diego and present the papers that we're working on. Yeah, yeah. I guess we we should mention, of course, uh, there 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 are the reports that are available from this reconnaissance, uh, publicly available, and um, and the group, and I mean others in the community, of course, are, are looking to document as best they can in technical papers. So, um, uh, with that, I with that, I think we can conclude then. Natalie, thank you very much for um, keeping us all in check. Uh, we're a little bit over the time. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for their fantastic presentations um, and for the excellent questions. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody.